You're listening to Little Green Cheese, episode 22. Welcome back, I'm Gavin Weber and this podcast is where you can learn about cheese making at home. It's been a long time since I recorded a cheese making podcast and I apologise profusely for being absent. I suppose it all started off when I lost my voice way back in March. I was just about to record a podcast episode and it didn't happen. I <laughs> yeah, I lost my voice. And you know how things get away from you and, uh, you know, you put it off and say, oh, this week I'll make one, this week I'll make one. Well, it kind of slipped away from me. Um, so many exciting things happening in the greening side of my life. I uh, I haven't been able to get round to recording a podcast episode. So once again, I apologise. And I think we'll leave it at that. Now, cheese making has been making it big in the news lately. Probably not so much the news, but here in Australia, we have a, it's a, It's one of those reality TV shows uh, around cooking, and it's called My Kitchen Rules. And I happened to notice in the grand final, I didn't watch it myself, but uh, my wife did and told me it was fantastic. And she mentioned that they made homemade mozzarella or 30-minute mozzarella for the grand final. And I thought, fabulous. Why not play a little bit of that, seeing that it has hit the mainstream? And then what I'll do, I'll talk about how I make mozzarella because... The 48-second clip really doesn't do it any justice. A caprese salad is mozzarella. That's the hero of the dish, and let's hope we can pull it off. We've seen some great cooking. We've seen some great technique in my kitchen rules, but making your own mozzarella in the grand final, this is taking to the next level. So, Chloe, how's the cheese looking, love? It's not cheese yet. To make the mozzarella for the first course, I need to create a curd. So I add milk, citric acid and rennet and bring up to 37 degrees. Just got to wait till it hits 37 degrees and bam. And then you need to allow it to sit for about 25 minutes. That cheese is just going to sit until the, the curd starts to firm up. If our mozzarella doesn't work out, then we don't have time to make another one. Like, this is it. We've got one batch, we've got one chance. It needs to be perfect. So how did they go? Well, I think the judges really liked the caprese salad. And the mozzarella did turn out okay. Uh, she managed to get into uh, little boccaccini balls. Um, and it was fresh as as fresh as the milk was, I suppose. And it did look very, very nice. Now, speaking of mozzarella, a couple of weekends ago, I made some mozzarella uh, using the 30-minute the uh, microwave version. And I made that for the eastern suburbs permaculture group they came around to our place to visit and as part of their tour which they paid for they got to see me make um, 30 minute mozzarella and they also got to taste it with some fresh tomatoes fresh heirloom tomatoes on top and some fresh basil which was really really delicious i did under salt the mozzarella not quite sure how but uh, we simply cracked some fresh sea salt on top of the cheese before we served it, and it turned out really, really well. So what are you going to do to make mozzarella? Well, I made a a cheese-making video tutorial, and that's available on YouTube, and what I'll do in the show notes, I'll put a link to that. And it's pretty basic. All you do is you you start off with four litres of milk. Um, If you need to, you add a bit of calcium chloride, a and then you add some citric acid, some lipase to enhance the flavour. If you're not going to eat it fresh, if you're going to eat it fresh, I wouldn't even worry about the lipase because it lipase doesn't um, it doesn't kick in until the next day. You don't get any flavour out of the lipase until the very next day. So omit that. Um, you add half a rennet tablet, and then at the end, um, once you're kneading the curd, then you add in some uh, some cheese salt. So you heat it up, the milk to about 33 degrees, add your ingredients, so add the uh, citric acid and uh, it slightly curdles. Then you add the rennet and then that breaks down into curds and whey and then you heat that up to 38 degrees or 37 as they mentioned in the um, in the My Kitchen Rules clip 
And then I leave it for about three to five minutes and then I drain it through some uh, cheesecloth. And then I pop it into a microwave bowl and then I heat it up uh, in the microwave for a minute on high uh, and then uh, drain off some, some more whey. Uh, and then I heat it two, to two more times for 30 seconds each, then uh, drain it off further, knead it even more, and then it starts to become shiny. Then I add the uh, cheese salt to it and then knead it and make it into balls. Now, to, to stop it from uh, cooking any further, I put it into iced water, and then you eat it straight away after that, and it's delicious. If you're going to save it for the next day, then add in uh, lipase, uh, and you'll see that in the recipe in the cheese-making video. Now, they didn't use a microwave, My Kitchen Rules. Uh, they just left the... They left the curd in the pot for an extra 25 minutes and then pulled it out and kneaded it. Um, yeah, that, that works as well. Really what you should do is you should heat the, the whey up to um, 80 degrees Celsius. Um, you pour a bit of salt into the whey and then shape the curd with two ladles or use a strainer and then uh, it's really, really runny uh, and then dip it into uh, the cold water and that firms it up. Pretty easy. Uh, mozzarella is one of the simplest cheese. It actually took me about two years of cheese making before I, I, I was kind of, I don't know, I was put off by mozzarella. I don't know why, but it is one of the tastiest, quick, certainly the quickest cheese um, to make. And and uh, once you add a little bit of basil and, and uh, you can drizzle anything over it, maybe some tomato uh, oil. So the oil left over from sun-dried tomatoes, drizzle a little bit of that over the top, salt and pepper, taste divine. Absolutely fabulous. In this week's show, we have three voicemails. Um, so I'll play those in a sec. And we also have quite a few emails that, uh, that I can reply to as well. It's been a few months. People haven't been letting me down. I've been plowing through the questions. People send me probably one or two a day around cheese making and methods and stuff like that. So let's get on to the voicemail questions. Right, the first voicemail question is from Dina, and uh, we'll just play that. Hello, Kevin. This is Dina here from Pittsburgh, Queensland, and I would like to ask you a question how to set the temperature controller what you use outside your bar fridge. I can't get it any further down than 17. Uh, no, it doesn't switch on. No, it doesn't switch on, my husband says. So what do we do wrong? Or can you give me an idea what we have to do? It's all Chinese on the box and I don't understand it at all. Thank you. Hope to hear from you soon. Well, I did answer this one back personally, besides on the podcast as I'm going to now. Uh, yes, it is all in Chinese, and that, that wasn't a joke. The packaging and the, the writing on the device itself is in Chinese, um, so there are no English instructions whatsoever. So it was a bit of a dilemma for me. I had the same issue. And the thermostat, I'll leave the link to it. You can buy it readily on eBay. Um, I think it ships out of Hong Kong or something like that. And basically, there's three buttons on it. in the mid So the middle button, to change it to for use for a cheese cave using a, a bar fridge, what you do is you press and hold the middle button until the light goes green. That's it. That's all you have to do. Press and hold the middle button until it goes green. And then you can set the temperature down to 13. And what happens if the fridge then starts to warm up and it gets to 13, the fridge turns on again and starts to make it cold again. It only turns on for about a minute or two. In fact, if you listen to it over the course of a day, it only runs for about five to six minutes a day, depending on how good the seal is on your cheese fridge. Very, very economical, and it makes a very good cheese. In fact, we just tasted one. We tasted a, a Cotswold uh, the other day that I had vac packed way back in way back in January when we had a cool spell, and it did taste delicious. So. It's keeping its temperature fine, the fridge is, and it's maturing the cheese well. Thanks, Dina, for your question. I appreciate uh, you calling in and asking. All right, so the next one is from Jean-Michel, our friend in Nice in France. Hello, Dan and Gavin. Uh, 
This is my second message because the first didn't go through the speak the speak pipe. <laughs> I think it didn't arrive in Australia. Um, uh, I've been making a, a car filly uh, with micro filtered milk and it worked well. And but the day after, I used uh, UTH milk because I I did not find micro filtered uh, milk. So uh, I failed. I mean, uh, even uh, having added the right amount of uh, ca calcium chloride at the right temperature, the right amount of rennet and everything, blah blah blah, the, I failed getting a firm curd. And uh, even after having waiting, waited uh, two hours or so, you know. So. Um, Maybe four degree uh, lower than what you 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 were asking in your recipe. I mean, I, I tried that. I, I hit it hit the milk at thirty two degrees Celsius and it went down to twenty eight. Maybe is it the reason? I hope so, but I'm not sure. You know. So uh, I cut the curd and I stirred uh, the curd very slowly and. Never saw any way, you know, any uh, oh, uh, yellow liquid at all, you know. And uh, when I poured the the mix into the colander, uh, the, it never dried. It stayed liquid and white. Everything was white, like, like the milk. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> are you getting firm curds with homogenized uh, UTH milk? Or not? This is my question. And uh, uh, if you get some good, good, good uh, and firm curd, <laughs> how do you manage to? to? Okay, <laughs> this is my question. So uh, thank you for your future reply. I hope you are recovered from your chest uh, infection. And, uh, be careful. Huh? Um, and uh, I hope to. Uh, listen to your future uh, podcast very soon bye bye thank you for everything see you Jean well thanks very much for your question john michelle i appreciate it and thanks for the um, for the uh, the shout out there for the chest infection yes it has gone away and i am functioning 100 percent now the answer to your question is that you cannot use ultra high temperature milk or uht or uth whatever they call it uh, you cannot use it for cheese making. The only cheese you'll get out of it, as you found, is ricotta, and it makes a pretty ordinary ricotta as well. And that is because the curds have been, the structure of the curds, uh, sorry, the structure of the milk has been destroyed through the temperature process. You can use homogenized milk um, at, a, um, at a pinch. I found one of the things that they're doing to some of the milks these days is they're ultra pasteurizing, which is very similar to what UHT is, and they're, they're rapidly heating it up way past the normal pasteurization temperature, and they destroy the milk structure with that as well. I found some organic milks sold here in Australia are ultra pasteurized, so stay clear of those as well. So, unfortunately, Jean-Michel, hopefully you went back to your micro-filtered milk and you made a wonderful kefili. But, uh, yeah, unfortunately, as you found out, you cannot use UHT milk for cheese making. So avoid it like the plague, please, mate. And thanks for your question once again. Okay, the next question's from Wayne, and he lives in northern New South Wales. The audio quality is a little bit uh, ordinary on this one. I'll try and clean it up a little bit. But uh, Wayne asks a very good question about the amount of culture to use whilst making cheese. Anyway, take it away, Wayne. Uh, good day, Gavin. It's Wayne from Northern Rivers, New South Wales. Here. Yeah. Been making cheeses all this week, uh, mostly following your recipes. Big thanks for all those videos. They really set you on the right track. But I have a bit of a problem as I've been getting. Uh, my mesophilic culture from Green Living in Brisbane, and uh, it obviously is a different culture to the one you use. And so I've used up a whole 
with a packet of it, supposed to be enough to do 100 litres, and three cheeses, uh, which is about 20 litres. Um, I'm finding it a bit difficult to work out uh, how much to put in. I can uh, work out that with this culture I get from green living, I put in about one sixteenth of a teaspoon or 10 litres of milk. But I notice that some of your recipes have varying amounts of culture. I have no idea how I'm to work out which the appropriate amount would be. Um, it would be good if you could help me with this. The other thing is, uh, I do salami, so I'm all set up for a, um, a refrigerator and all the controls. Uh, and I have a um, ultrasonic humidifier. Uh, to keep the humidity up, but I'd rather not use it if I can because to have it going over two or three months is a bit of a pain in the neck. Um, so I'm hoping that I can get the uh, humidity up above it, 70% anyway, and, and I'll see how I go with that. Once again, thanks for your program and hope you can help us. Thank you. No problems, Wayne. Thanks very much for your question. Um, I actually do use the cultures from Green Living Australia, a great company up there in uh, Queensland and great providers of cheese making materials. Now, what I do, and uh, and sorry for the confusion, yes, in some of the recipes in my book it does state that you need a quarter of a teaspoon of uh, cheese culture. That's more for the uh, American market. What I do, I follow that whatever culture I buy here in Australia, uh, usually they're imported from Italy anyway, uh, I follow the instructions on the pack. So it tells you, so if it's, say, a Sabco cheese culture and it says it's good for 100 litres of milk for that tiny little packet, I think the recommendation is you use uh, one uh, 32nd of a teaspoon or one 16th of a teaspoon, depending on which culture you're using, whether it be mesophilic or thermophilic. For most of the recipes that I use for cheeses that need mesophilic culture, I used a heaped smidgen, which is about one sixteenth of a teaspoon, uh, and that's fine for eight litres of milk. If you start using more milk, then obviously add a little bit more culture. Uh, the culture does take, you know, a right amount of time. Um, if you stick to that guideline, you should be fairly right. With thermophilic culture, you can add about the same amount. I don't, I just use a level smidgen, which is one thirty. 32nd of a of a teaspoon uh, and that's pretty simple there's no problems with that at all so sorry for the confusion so some of the cultures you get from the US especially from the New England cheese uh, cheese making company you actually do have to use quarter of a teaspoon because I think they bulk it out with uh, lactose or something in their in their packets but uh, yeah the ones we get here direct from Italy um, yeah only use a 16th of a teaspoon or a heap smidgen uh, and that works fine. Uh, as for your other question, Wayne, around uh, cheese fridge humidity, all I do is I've got a container in the bottom of my fridge with water and I've got a sponge sitting in it and that provides about between 70 and 75% relative humidity in the cheese fridge and that works well. Also, if you are vac packing your cheeses for maturing purposes, then you won't need to keep the humidity up in the fridge um, so the, the cheese will regulate itself. It'll keep the moisture in through the vac packing. Um, however, if you're waxing the cheese, make sure that you do uh, increase the humidity to whatever's recommended on the recipe because the uh, the cheese wax is porous and it does breathe. Um, so you'll need to keep the moisture up in there or they do dry out, I've noticed, over time. So thanks very much for your question, mate. So let's get into the reader questions. Uh, these have been sent in to me by email. So the first one is from Ross Thompson, and Ross is from uh, Melbourne in Victoria. Uh, Ross says, Hi Gavin, my apologies if you've already answered this question on my, your blog. I'm an avid home brewer, and as such I have a refrigerator with a temp controller inside which I use for fermenting the beer. There is a shelf in the fridge just crying out for some cheese making, but the vast majority of beer I make are fermented between 18 and 20 degrees Celsius. Is there a cheese style where this temperature is appropriate for maturing? 
Well, thanks for your question, Ross. Uh, fortunately, I can't think of any cheeses that will mature at this high temperature. Uh, most of the recipes that I have um, mature between seven in the case of the bloomy rind cheeses and 13, which is most of the uh, the harder um, the hard harder or semi-hard cheeses. So hopefully uh, that'll help you out. Um, maybe if you're brewing lagers, uh, which are uh, low temperature beers, you could uh, mature some cheese there. But thanks for your question, Ross. The next question is from Steve. Uh, Steve says, hi, Gavin. Saw your thing on TV last night and I'm hooked. I'm really keen to read your book, but is it totally free to download? Also, can I have a list of cheese making courses for 2014, please, as well as directions to Melton? Is there a tram, tram train from Melbourne? I'm from Tassie, so new to the area if I come over. Thanks again, Steve. Well, thanks, Steve, for watching. I was actually on Channel 7 about a month ago. I think it was in March. Um, on the Channel 7 News, just to show my my lifestyle, it was a bit of a hit, so that was really good. Uh, the ebook, Steve, in answer to your question, is not free to download. You have to pay for it. It's six dollars ninety nine for the ebook. Keep calm and make cheese. So you can download that on the site. Also, uh, there's some supplementary recipes that are bundled. Um, if you want to get the uh, the plus version, as I call it, um, you can get that for seven ninety nine US dollars. Um, as for cheese making courses, uh, they're listed on my um, our business page, which is littlegreenworkshops.com.au. Uh, I'll pop that in the show notes. But there's one cheese making course coming up in June uh, for mozzarella and ricotta. Uh, and that should be good fun. That's in uh, Melton South. But thanks very much for your question, Steve. Uh, the next question is from Kim Odlin, or Odland, uh, and she's from Esquimalt in British Columbia, Canada. She says, Hi, Gavin. When Jarlsberg style cheese is doing the couple week of washing and bubble development, what smell should come off the cheese? Well, Kim. I think it smell, should smell cheesy. <laughs> if it has an off smell, it really shouldn't um, produce any off smells during that 21-day uh, um, eye development stage. If it does, then uh, I would just wipe it again with some um, with some brine solution, just to wipe the outside. That keeps it moist and um, helps the eyes um, to expand when it's making it. So if it does start to smell a bit off, um, just give it another wipe with the uh, with the brine solution and a clean cloth, uh, and that helps and, and does wonders. And thanks very much for your question, Kim, all the way from Canada. Lovely. The next question is from Stan, uh, Stan Neal. And Stan says, Hi, Gavin, I've just finished watching your video on making Swiss cheese and was most impressed with your commentary and presentation. It certainly was very easy for a complete novice to follow. I was also impressed with the digital timer that you used to time various stages. Could you let me know the make and name and where I will be able to purchase a similar model? Keep up the good work with the videos and many thanks, Stan. Well, Stan, it was as simple as my old i uh, What was it? What's it called? Uh, it's an iTouch. Oh, sorry, I, iPod Touch, they're called. Um, and it's got a clock feature on it, and I just use that for the timer. Um, it doesn't work for anything else because the operating system's out of date. So I just use it for the clock feature and the alarm feature, and that works wonderfully. Uh, it also works, you know, you can use your iPhone or, or Android phone, whatever. Uh, it's got a great little timer feature on it, and it works fine, especially for, make, you know, cheese making. Um, so, yeah, use something as simple as that if you've got it. Uh, if not, just get a normal kitchen timer. Um there's even a timer on most stoves or microwaves these days, so just use that, and you can time the set up the time for the different stages between um, each stage of your cheese. So thanks very much for your question, Stan. Okay, the next question is from Joe Dudley, and Joe is from Silverthorne, Colorado, USA. It says, hi, Gavin. You're a joy to listen to on YouTube, and your book is fantastic. Made kafili cheese last Sunday. I have a question on the Emmentaler. Made one Friday night. I set it out to dry, and after two weeks, it cracked. It was not. 
Sorry, I'll start again. It has not had time to form a rind yet. Can I save it? 64 degrees Fahrenheit, 8,500 foot elevation in Colorado, 63% humidity. Cracking Emmental, oh, that's a good question. It's difficult to diagnose it, uh, Joe, without a without a picture, uh, unfortunately. But uh, what we can, what you could do is you could wax it straight away and see if that will form the eyes. Certainly save your cheese, even if it doesn't form into uh, an Emmentaler style cheese, then it will still taste delicious. It'll have that nutty flavour that the um, so the culture that you add to it to create the eyes. Uh, gives it that nutty flavour. So even if the eyes don't form because the cheese is cracked, then, um, yeah, there's no real issue. Now, I think without a photo, I think the issue would be the humidity. It needs to be fairly humid, um, so around 70 degrees. Normally around here, like currently right now, it's 10.8 degrees Celsius and 72% humidity. So that would be ideal to air dry. But if it's a really dry climate, you may need to keep the cheese in a, um, a maturation box um, and uh, and that will increase the humidity whilst you're doing the 21 uh, day period of eye forming. So that's the only thing I can really think of. Um, sorry if I didn't answer your question, Joe, but hopefully it's helped a little bit. Uh, the final question I have is from Rick and Rick's from Texas. He says, hi, Gavin. Thank you for the fantastic videos and cheese making lessons. Anyway, I have purchased a Jersey cow. Well, he's gone hardcore, Rick. Um, and I get three gallons of milk a day. So my question is this. Should I bring the temperature of the milk to 180 before I use it to make cheese? I think he means 80. Um, the milk in the store is pasteurized and I'm not sure what to do there or can I just leave it alone and just follow your directions? In answer to your question, Rick, yeah, um, back in the old days before they had fridges and stuff, when they got the milk straight from the cow, um, the milk, when they processed it to to make cheese, they started off at the room temperature, well, the 30 degrees that it comes out of the cow. It's about 36 degrees. Um, so you could use it straight away. As soon as you milk it, make sure the milk's clean, of course. Um, that's if you want to make cheese with uh, raw milk. If not, you may have to pasteurise it. There's some pasteurisation instructions uh, on the blog and in the ebook. So you could um, certainly use the milk as is right now, and it would make one delicious cheese. But as long as your uh, milking area and the teats on the cow are clean and everything's clean, then yeah, it's fairly safe to make a raw milk cheese. You wouldn't have any problems there. So best of luck, Rick, and really hope you enjoy your new Jersey cow and are making delicious cheese. I'd love a report back if you have one. Thanks very much for your question. Well, everybody, that's about all I've got time for this week. A good podcast. I really enjoyed it. And it was really great to see that um, home cheese making made mainstream with the My Kitchen Rules little ex excerpt that I put in there. It was a bit of a, uh, a shock to the system when my wife told me about it. I thought, no, I don't make cheese on mainstream television. But yeah, the judges were really pleased with it and they, they enjoyed the taste of it and they said that their salad was really, really nice. So um, there you go. So mozzarella, 30-minute mozzarella makes mainstream television. Thanks, everybody, for your questions for this episode. I really enjoyed answering them. Uh, keep those voicemails coming in. I'll leave a, a link to SpeakPipe. Uh, it's on the right-hand sidebar of the blog, but uh, you can just go to, I'll put a button there and you can um, click through and record a message for me if you have a cheese-making message. The more messages I get, the longer the shows go uh, and the more informative they are for other people as well. So just think if you've got a question when you're making home cheese, just think that other people probably have the same question that they want answered. So throw it out there, I'll catch it and I'll answer it for you. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening to the show. I hope you enjoyed the return of the Little Green Cheese podcast. Anyway, Gavin, you are currently my inspiration, and I and I just wanted to tell you that and make sure you knew that and make sure you know that you've guided me into the brilliant 
and loving and creative and extremely emotional world of cheese making, mate. It's just, you're, you're my saviour. You're my Jesus. Thank you very much. For upcoming workshop dates, you can find them on my blog, littlegreencheese.com. You can also find my ebook, Keep Calm and Make Cheese, The Beginner's Guide to Cheese Making at Home. That's available in all ebook formats and at all good ebook retailers. You can also find my cheese making video tutorials within the ebook or on my YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, Curd Nerds, and stay tuned for the next episode of the Little Green Cheese Podcast. During this podcast, you heard royalty-free music by Kevin MacLeod. I played Malt Shop Bop and Call to the Dairy Cows.